Hi. Hi. Hey. This is a tricky time. You've been focused all day and tired, maybe feeling nappish. So thank you. Thank you for being here and for... Um, it's, I never really know how to introduce myself. Um, I tell you I'm a systems architect, which I am, but I'm also not my, my resume. And it's kind of awkward because we're going to spend 35 minutes in conversation, but I'm going to do all the talking. So I, I never quite know how to begin. So I decided I would begin with introducing you to some beings that I live with. This is Theodore Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Maximilian Robespierre. Um, guess which one thinks he's in charge? You, I'm sure you guessed, I'm sure you guessed correctly. So I'm going to start with asking us, but it's also sort of my wish for the world, that we make a bit less drama, that we focus a little bit less on what we think, and instead we begin to focus more on how we think. So let me give you an example of something I've been hearing a lot of lately. Maybe you've heard this. Um, it's very interesting to me because suddenly Agile is, the, Agile is the reason for climate change. Agile is the reason for every suffering I've ever experienced in tech. When I listen to people talk, it's quite shocking to me. Um, how strong these feelings can, um, can be. And so maybe you agree with this, maybe you disagree, but you've probably had this conversation. And this is why I don't have these conversations in this way anymore. Because there are four patterns that keep reoccurring when we're trying to focus on what is right to think. The first one is derision. So we love hating on stuff. I'm also guilty of this. Come ask me about safe. And you will hear a lot of my derision. But it doesn't actually help us to come to any productive conclusions. We're just hating on things. So you may have heard this. So this is a paraphrase of a tweet that turned into a whole thing. Um, and every time I speak at a conference, this is an argument happening in the hallway, what is architect, what is architecture. I've seen CTOs give talks that basically say this. I never quite know how to take this. Um, but the challenge is that it isn't actually helping us resolve what architecture is or what the role of architect is. So the other thing is we are super trendy. We don't think we're into fashion, but we really are. Like what's the hottest tool? What am I supposed to hate now? And you know, like for example, Agile. I met a woman in her 80s who was a systems architect in the 70s and she described all the things that we think we're just figuring out now as part of her regular life. And she said, I'm sure things are a lot better now. No, we're reinventing the 70s, right? We keep going around in these same circles. This is another pattern, change my mind. It is not my job to change your mind. It is your job to change your mind. I am thrilled to have discourse when we disagree about something, I think it's very valuable when we have different points of view to share the reasons that convinced us. But this is not worth my time. And the fourth one is straw man. So when I really dive in and ask people, why do you think agile is evil? Why do you think architecture is a bullshit role? They describe horror to me. I'm like, well, I'd hate that too. Legitimately, that's awful. But it's not agile or architecture. At least it's not agile or architecture as I understand it. So one of the things we do is we take a bad example and then we stab it 
with the pitchfork of our opinions. And this is where we get stuck. So I decided that opinions are not my reality. And honestly, here's the thing, it makes me sad. The things that people are describing, they just don't align with the last 15 or 18 years in which I've been growing and learning and um, being able to do hard things. So I started to think about what, what, what is it that I most value, regardless of what we call it. So one of the, the here's my, so if, if, uh, if opinion is not my reality, this is my reality. So I started as a back-end um, engineer and built monoliths. I built the monoliths, um, as many of us have. And now I build systems, so all the words um, microservices, event-based interactions, enterprise integration patterns, all those things. This is, this is what I do now. And the challenge is we all learned that thinking is, in fact, one type of thinking. It's linear thinking. Rational, top-down, procedural, predictable, concerned with control. These are all friendly engineering words. Right? We need these skills to build software. But they have a limit. And when I saw this image, I first thought it's me. And secondly, I started to think about the person in the doorway. What happens when they turn back around into this room and try to have a conversation? N nothing good like <laughs> that. And also, um, what, what do the person in the doorway need nowadays to be able to live in the reality of this complexity, right? So I work um, predominantly in information systems, and it's truly staggering how the information system that is the digital distribution, part of which is the internet, how much has changed for people who are uh, distributing and sharing information just in the last 10 years. So the paradigm is shifting around us and we need to expand our skill set. So we still need linear thinking, we still need the ability to practice reductionism, to take complexity and break it down into smaller manageable parts. But it isn't all we need. We also need the ability to synthesize knowledge and information to be able to come to a conclusion when there is no right answer. There's no one right thing for the organization to do. So how do we take action with some confidence that we have well architected, um, well architected our decision? And my experience has been that on the teams that I've worked on, where we did hard things and succeeded at doing those hard things, there was always a blend. They always had a lot of systems thinking skills, we just didn't know to call it that. And conversely, the more control and linear processes were involved, the less likely we were to succeed at, at transformation. So this is the tricky part. We're terrible at systems thinking. One, because we haven't learned to do it. I mean, that's fair. But also, it's a practice. It's like I'm terrible at running marathons. And the reason I'm terrible at running marathons is I don't run. I don't like to run. I never run. If I was going to run a marathon, I would need to practice. Similar when we expand our tool set for being able to think and design uh, systems. And one of the challenges for us is that systems are socio-technical, right? You can't take away what people are thinking and communicating from what we push to production, and yet we vociferously persist in trying to imagine them as, as two different things. And so Piercing says in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, basically that the true system is the construction 
of rationality of systemic thought itself. Right? Keep in mind, we're making this up. We made up Agile. That's not a real thing. We made it up. And then we decided to use those words to describe certain behaviors. Same with architecture. And so he says that if a factory is torn down, but the rationality that produced it builds another factory, you get, an, it builds the next thing, you get another factory. This was my experience with microservices, right? We took the monolith and we made microservices and we had a distributed monolith in the cloud because we needed to figure out how to change our core mental models. So you probably know Conway's law. Very few of us give talks on systems without the requisite Conway's law that the systems will be copies of an organization's communication structure. And I've ex hijacked Conway's law to say teams who design systems will produce copies of their own thinking and communication patterns. So this is a thing I've really struggled with as all the agile hating has happened, is, is, has become as we lose the process, is that we're losing this core reality. It doesn't matter what we call it. It just matters that we can think well together about complex, difficult things and take good, sound, solid action together. And so, um, so there's rarely one right answer. And so, these are the patterns. This is what I call modern agility. These are the patterns that what I discovered as a systems architect was the things I learned as an engineer on, on really high performing agile teams are the things I need in order to do systems architecture, that there's a lot of overlap. And that, you know, when you can handle complexity and ambiguity and flexibility and enjoyability, these qualities are essential to our ability to think in systems. This is one of my favorite quotes. A client said this to me a long time ago. Agile was invented because reality refuses to bow down to power. If this is fixed, I didn't get the memo. Right? Like, my job is to speak truth to power because we have ideas about how things should work. Some of them are good. A lot of them are not. And I feel like as um, a, a lot of my work is what's actually happening and how do I communicate that in a productive, um, in a productive way. And it's really important this ability to think well together. Fred Brooks says, conceptual integrity, meaning the thinking has, is, has inter, is inter, well integrated, not controlled, just friendly. The ideas are friendly. They're in good relationship to each other, is the most important consideration in systems design. And this is what we see most often right? Cat herding. Um, that, oh, I just can't tell you how many times. Like, you've got five people in a room and they're all cats. They all have ideas. They're all doing the thing. So what happens? We hire a project manager to go into the room and make the cats get along. We call it cat herding roles, right? And sometime last year, I came to the conclusion Nobody gets to be a cat. Let's start there. Let's start with nobody gets to be a cat. It is our, our job to lean in, to try and figure out how to row in the same direction, even though we'll fail, even though it's hard, even though I really want to bite somebody rather than be nice today. Like that, that's all just part of our, of our process. And I came to this conclusion in part because I saw one drowning initiative. It was getting worse and millions of dollars were being lost. So they started hiring more managers. And in the end, there were more managers than implementers. And it still sunk because of course it did, right? So five qualities that I learned from agility 
that I learned from high performing teams doing hard things. And also I've learned from my own strengths and weaknesses. The first is that we share expertise by partnering. So you suck at something, guaranteed. No matter how 10X you are in your role, you have weaknesses. Mine is talking business language to the business side. I think I'm great at it. It's pretty straightforward, right? I hear it all the time. And then I will write a, a, a one-page description of a recommendation and have someone good at business language look, and they're like, geek, geek, nerd, tech, geek, like, no. So I've learned I need people to help translate me, help me translate me. Also, I'm a systems architect, so I communicate visually a lot, and I, you do not want to play Pictionary with me. I am the worst visual person you are likely to meet in your life. So designers are my best friend. They'll say, do this, do this. Oh my God, where's the key? Add a key. Colors matter, Diana. Use colors to mean something. And then suddenly people understand what I'm trying to communicate because someone good at visual communication helped me. And so as a team, the goal is that we are brilliant and able to do hard things. Not that I am necessarily, but that we are together. When you're designing systems, what you're trying to do is design for emergence. If I have a software part here and a software part here, when I form a relationship between them, I want to get something I couldn't get from either part alone, right? Systems architecture is, I would argue, designing relationships. We want the same thing in people. When we put two people in a room, you want to get more than you could have gotten from any one person alone in the room. So the second one is respect for each other's leadership. So my son got married last year, which is really weird because I'm still 32, so I don't really understand how that happened. Um, but he got married last year and his wife was a tax lawyer. She didn't love it. And now she's going into tech. And so she's, um, She's working on a degree, and I invited her to join um, a project that uh, a small team and I are working on. It's a greenfield project. And so she joined, and um, she was coming to planning, and she said, as everybody says the first time they're exposed to this, I, I can't size stories. I have no idea what you would do. And I'm like, trust me, just try to see. By the second planning, not only is she, um, you know, learning and experiencing from us talking about the stories, but twice she asked a question <laughs> and the engineer and I are like, oops, yeah, we didn't think of that, right? So this process of being able to think critically for yourself, but then also resolve that thinking with your teammates until you're sort of seeing things similarly enough to act on them. That was core to my career. And it's very strange to me now how much of a challenge that can be for, uh, for so many teams. And where this comes down to fundamentally is accountability. So I'm gonna tell you two stories about me and a product owner um, it was what we called uh, that role at the time. It's the same product owner is kind of important to know. So he was pushing a new feature for users that would be, you know, a million people would really love this. And he said, Diana, I want people to jump right in and engage. So when they register for this, I don't want them to verify their email address. They have to go away and do that. I don't want that. I want them to just create their profile and dive right in. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I can tell you exactly where that's going to go. So you imagine friendly people are out there waiting to use your thing. And there are like three of those, but there's a million bots and hackers and like, it's going to be a mess. He heard me. He's respectful. It was his decision to make. So he decided, and we built it, and 
I was very smug about. Then he had to do a whole sprint of having us build the thing I had suggested to build because, of course, they were full, it was full of spam and that was a problem. Fast forward a few months, we're pushing something to production and he said, Diana, do we need to do performance testing? And I'm like, no, we don't have to. We changed one query, I wrote like three lines of code, it's a relatively small change. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Would you bet my career on it? Yes, really. Mm -hmm. So you know where this is going? Mm -hmm. Three days later, the ops team is putting out a P1 yelling and screaming because production is going down. So my SQL had a bug in the max function. Guess what function I wrote? The one little line that I changed. Had we done performance testing, we probably would have seen it. But it, it, it just doesn't return anything, but sometimes it does. Like we, maybe we wouldn't have seen it. I take comfort in that. So who was up at two o'clock in the morning fixing that? Me, right? Because he respected that it was my decision and I made it and I was accountable and I couldn't feel smug about the email thing anymore. So the third is investing time, energy, and attention. So we overfocus on linear metrics and time is one of them. But in fact, it's our energy and attention that has value as knowledge workers. Our time matters, but it's secondary. You maybe have experienced this occasionally in your work in tech. We are a very no culture. No, 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 no. And this is, I think, one of our primary blockers to being able to do systemic reasoning. It's a version of change my mind. It is, we're very distracted when people are wrong, right? This is an improvisational comedy team. Do you know, have you seen, have you seen improv? Uh, there's an American show, or there's also a British version, whose line is it anyway? So basically, the actors go out on stage, and the audience tells them what they're going to be acting out. There's no script. It's truly terrifying and delightful and wonderful. Their primary rule is yes and. They warm up before they go out on stage. Someone says, pat your head, like Simon says, yes. The reason they do it is not to agree with each other or to align or to subvert their creativity to the man. There's none of that. It's that when someone puts out an idea, you acknowledge the idea and go from there. Even if you're going to pivot or when someone puts out an idea, I might say, ah, oh, tell me more about this and then say, huh, may I offer you a different perspective and basically tell them why I completely and wholly think differently than they think. That's okay. There's still been the acknowledgement. This is the one change I would, if I had to pick one change, this would be it. The practice of yes and, acknowledging what's being said. I have taught improv. My, I had a, an engineering team early on. We're like, we really want to learn that. Will you do a workshop? Sure. They were better than the actors I worked with in my previous life when I did such a thing. We are doing improv all the time, right? Thinking on our feet. And this is a skill that helps us do it better together. So we, we are focused on ways of working that are energizing and also protecting our energy, cat herding, is not protecting our energy. How do we set up systems of support for our work that give us back the kind of energy we need and allow us to do deep work, to focus for at least some period most days on figuring out things that are hard to think about? And so this is a, um, not a tech book at all, The Power of Full Engagement, but I found it incredibly useful. And he talks about energy, not time, is our most precious resource. And it shifted me to begin to pay attention to what gave me more energy to do more complicated things and what made me, 
go make chicken wings and binge watch Netflix at the end of the day, every day for a month. That has happened too. This is the fifth most popular XKCD of all time. And there's a reason for it, right? We're very distracted by fixing things that are wrong. That's okay, we're not gonna stop doing it. Also, we get paid to fix things that are wrong, so I think it's a good habit. But it's an energy drain when you're on the other side of it. And science supports this. Higher optimism and lower pessimism are associated with reasoning skills. I have zero proof, zero science fact, that people who are enjoyable to work with are better thinkers. But it is my experience that this is often the case. That the ability to enjoy doing difficult things, thinking well together, corresponds with the skill to do so. So I... This is my favorite one. And what's interesting is Romeo and I had a talk today about this is a tricky word, learning. Like you're thinking about exams maybe, you might be thinking about um, exercises, grades. This is not what I mean. What I mean is, is this question. I don't know, let's find out. I don't know, let's find out. This is such a hallmark of knowledge work that I don't know how it's gotten lost. Like we didn't, we didn't know what we were building because no one had built it before. So our desire, our, our voracious curiosity was so essential to our work that I would argue that as knowledge workers, cultivating and strengthening and supporting that, I don't know, let's find out, is a big part of how we um, transform things or invent things. And so Danella Meadows, my favorite book on systems thinking, though I'm writing one, so that hopefully will become my favorite book, um, says that systems can't be controlled, but they can be designed and redesigned, that we can't just surge forward with certainty into a world of no surprises, which is what we keep trying to do again and again and again, but we can expect surprises and learn from them and even profit from them. I have learned more from failure than success. Maybe this is the case for you as well. Like, I hated it going through it, but it was an amazing teacher. And what is even failure and success? Because some of the things I failed at have taught me I didn't fail, the system did not support change. So it's, it's a very complex question. And then the last one, the fifth one, iterate and improve the rules of the game. Retrospectives are my favorite thing. My husband and I go on vacation and we do a retrospective on the way home. Yeah, right? We, we have a JIRA board for household tasks. We don't size the stories though. So I feel like, I feel like that, that, that kind of saves me. But this is why though that this is important. What we're actually practicing is metacognition. We're not just thinking, we're thinking about thinking. And we are restructuring our processes as we learn by doing retrospectives. And this ability to own your own reality is critical to, I think, the work that we're doing. And so regardless of whether we're doing Agile or Scrum or whatever, I do think that retrospecting is a critical skill. And James Clear in Atomic Habits says, we do not rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. So when the world around us supports these five qualities, we are going to surprise ourselves with how much we can do together. And when it doesn't, we are going to surprise ourselves with how much we need to eat chicken wings and binge watch Netflix every night because we're exhausted from the effort. There is a secret sixth one, and that is that you need to be really good at building tech. This is true. Obviously, we need the skills, right? We need the tech skills. We have to be able to do and implement the work that we need to do and implement. So I'm not leaving this out. 
It is very, of course, it's critical. But I am going to make a point. I have never met someone in tech in my career with those five qualities who weren't also good at building tech, good at the tech. I have met a lot of people good with good tech skills who don't have the five qualities. And so what I'm hoping is that we begin to expand our definition of tech skills to include these types of processes and practices so that I, as a systems architect, don't quit and become a tax lawyer and let my daughter-in-law now take over all of, the, all of the drama. So sharing expertise by partnering, repeat, respect other people's leadership in whatever form that, I don't mean titles, hierarchy, I mean their thinking. Invest time, energy, and attention Learn, be curious, let's, I don't know, let's see, and improve the rules of the game, not just playing the game. And of course, be super awesome at implementing Kafka streams if that's your thing. So I am writing a book for O'Reilly, Learning Systems Thinking. I also publish a newsletter. Um, if you go to learningsystemsthinking.com, also takes workshops and other things you can kind of all, all find from there. Um, I hang out mostly on LinkedIn now because you know why. You know why I'm there. Um, and so do also connect with me there and I'd love to hear. Um, it's a weird conversation. So feel free to say things back even though we don't have the opportunity here. Yeah? Okay. Thank you.